Hello, Church viewers and listeners. Thank you again for joining us today. Um, thank you again for joining us today um, on another edition of the Talk on STEM Careers Program presented to you by Teen Leadership and Entrepreneur Development Foundation. Um, I'm your host, Augustina Osabute, and I have with me Tiana Williams. Um, she's a very wonderful lady, and I'm very excited to meet her and finally have a conversation with her today. Thank you all for joining us today once again. Um, please try and then subscribe to our YouTube channel, Teen Leadership and Entrepreneur Development Foundation. So on our YouTube channel, we have it, Teen Lead Foundation. On LinkedIn, we have uh, our social media handle as Teen Lead Foundation. And here on Facebook, we have it as Teen Leadership and Entrepreneur Development Foundation. Once again, thank you for joining us today. And today, um, our topic will be the evolving technological geography and its vast applications. And I, as I said earlier, I have this wonderful lady here who will be taking us through that. Sienna, you are welcome to our platform. Thank you, thank you. Um, so for the benefit of our viewers and listeners, could you please give a brief introduction about yourself, where you come from in Ghana, your education, yeah. Okay. So, hello everyone once again. Um, my name is Sihana Lena Williams, and I am known as a GIS personality in Ghana. I am actually um, a past student of how many schools? About four schools. Oh. Primary school. Um, I attended Andy Memorial I, from Tema. Then I went on to Queensland, I went on to University Primary, Ligon. Then in high school, I went to um, Holy Child School, Cape Coast. So I'm a Hobson, a proud Hobson. And I went on to Ligon, back again to Ligon. There I studied geography and resource development. And um, I worked at... Um, a geography, sorry, a GIS and tech company known as Hanson New Data. I went on to work for uh, Voltagana Limited, and I am now trying to enter into the tech space. So that's kind of like my life journey in about two minutes. <laughs> that's a wonderful journey and a wonderful background about you. So um, how was life as a child in your community? I mean, you didn't mention the community where you grew up, but how was life in that community? Okay, so I am a former TM chick. <laughs> That's how some of them say it's Tema. I used to live oh. in Tema. And growing up, well, I didn't keep too long there, so I don't remember too much. But it was all... I, I used to go out a lot. The community was really small. And we knew each other in the area. So it was more like the children had this time that they come out to play, had this time that we are indoors and all that. And I moved to Spintex, where I currently living. And over there, I spent the rest of my life. So it hasn't been any busy kind of background. My where I've always lived has always been very reserved and quiet. So that's kind of how I actually am. I'm quite a reserved person, but when the time comes to talk, that's when I can talk, yes. So can you tell us about the course, like what program did you study in senior high school and what inspired you to choose that particular program? Okay, so, um, in high school, I studied general arts. That's the combination um, geography, French, and elective mathematics. 
with uh, economics. So I chose that course because I actually had no choice. The courses they had available, the one I wanted to do wasn't part. So I had to choose the one that had the geography that I really wanted to do. So I chose geography because I had that decision. I actually made my decision to do geography since GHS. So that's actually motivated me to continue it in high school and further continue it in university. So yeah, most of us know that uh, the art classes is mostly female dominated. Was it like that in in your class? Uh, high school. Well, my school is an all girls school. It was an all girls school, so definitely we're only girls. But in university, um, I'll just say we're kind of fifty fifty in level hundred. It's as we go higher in the higher levels, and that's when you see um, the ladies. Not a lot of ladies doing the uh, what's it called the major. So there was, a, there was a part of university where you have to choose whether you want to major in one course or you'd like to combine with another course. And with those who were majoring, um, most of them were guys, especially those who did the GIS course. Most of them were guys. So, so like, uh, what was your uh, major again in the university? So I majored in geography and resource development, yes. Mm-hmm. So I did not combine with any other course, but I did psychology and religion. So my- what, what, what is this um, program about this geography and resource development? What is it about? What is it? Okay. Uh, so geography and resource development uh, covered basically anything related to the earth surface. So we had to do a lot of theory work around space and time, um, thinking in anything, any phenomenon that goes on. So we had geography and health. We did courses of geography and health where we had to look at the spatial temporal analysis, that space and time analysis of things related to health. So you can look at malaria, the areas that have higher malaria levels as to as compared to areas that have lower. So kind of analysis like that. We had transportation and space economy, where we looked at the kind of um, kind of uh, analysis based on the kind of transportation we have. Why certain areas uh, have these transportation matters? Maybe the traffic jams as against other areas at different times of the day and other like that. So we also had uh, geography. That's the core one that everybody knows. That's geomorphology, where we looked at the uh, landforms. So the causes of earthquakes, the causes of floods, the causes of any um, disaster. We had also analysis on cities, why cities are expanding, what's, how they are expanding, the kind of patterns they take, and the kind of ways people are settling down in areas. So it covers, it cuts across almost every field. And we looked at more of the location aspect of it in relation to space and time. So um, from what you've just said, uh, this particular program is very important and especially um, with the development of Ghana. So um, a young one out there or a teenager out there will say that, okay, um, she has said a lot of stuff, but what particular institutions can I uh, work in or work with if I pursue this program? in the university. So can you let us know some of the institutions that um, one can work with if they pursue um, this particular program? That's a very good question. Sorry, that's a very good question. And even up to now, it's a little difficult to kind of explain this because um, GIS, that's the, the tech aspect of geography, that's what it's evolving. Um, I mean, geography is evolving into and it's getting more attention. But the aspects or the sectors that um, Ghana we have, that's the business sectors and stuff, most of them do not kind of add that to their systems. So, but they also hold a majority of, let's say, the working 
sector. But unfortunately, they do not use that technology enough. So we don't really have that many companies that employ people in the GIS field. But if you're looking at geography, I mean, geography can be applied. If you do geography, you can work anywhere. You can even work in a marketing team in a bank. You can work um, in the utility um, industry. So if there's any, uh, sorry, electricity company around you, you can work with them. If there's a telecom company, especially those who, the telecom companies actually use GIS because they have to know where they have to uh, mount their mast and others. So I keep telling people who are doing GIS that they shouldn't um, concentrate on only GIS or geography, but they should learn other things in relation to it or in addition to it. So you can actually go into any field after school, but if you want to do core geography, then you might have to learn the tech aspect. You must have to add a bit of tech that's programming, drone and other things before you can actually get a wider selection of or a wider pool of companies that you can work in. Yeah. Okay. That is a very interesting explanation and thank you very much from that for that. I'm really learning a lot today. And our viewers out there, uh, if you just joined us, my name is Augustine Osabute and I am hosting this program presented to you by Twin Leadership and Entrepreneur Development Foundation. And I have this great lady here, Sienna Williams with us, who is giving us a very insightful um, information about GIS. So um, we'll move forward. So like, um, just let us try and then finish with this, your schooling aspects or your background. So like, whilst in school, did you do any extracurricular activities? Oh, yes. I, I was actually a school. So I was the um, handball captain for Volta Hall um, for two years. And I was also the sports secretary for Volta Hall. I've forgotten the administrative year. I think 2015, 2016. And... Uh, I was also part of the technical team for my church group. And yeah, I think that was about it. So mostly sports. So sports used to take a lot of my time. So it was sports and church with my school then. So like most people or most parents out there when um, their kids or their wards try to um participate in extracurricular activities, they will be like, no, you have to concentrate on your books. But um, from your perspective, does like when one participates in this extracurricular activities, do they in any way affect their like studies? And do you regret doing that? Or do you like, were you, are you glad you were able to um, participate in this extracurricular activities? Oh, uh, well, I keep saying that when you are in school, um, school actually prepares you for life. So if you are someone who, basically you'd have to know how to think for yourself, how to make the best decisions for yourself. And the number one thing you would learn when you're in school is time management. So that's the part where if you are taking, if you want to take extracurricular activities and you take it up, you would have to personally sit down and know how to manage your time. Because there will be times when you would have to maybe forego one class to maybe take, for me, for instance, I had a lot of matches that had to take place during work hours, sorry, school hours. <laughs> So with that, I had to know how to revise, when to revise. If I have training in the morning, I wake up very early, go for my training, get back, get dressed, go to class, get back, do my assignments. I don't, I try as much as possible not to procrastinate. So you have to be really disciplined if you want to take up extracurricular activities. If your parents are against it, you would have to listen to them. But if you yourself have made up your mind 
that this extracurricular activity would actually contribute to my future career. Then you would have to sit down with your parents, explain to them why you're taking it up and explain to them what you can get from it. So do not go to your parents just saying that I want to do this. You have to tell them why you are doing it. So me, for instance, my mom is a coach. So she understood me doing sports and she even kept on telling me that I need to learn time management and be disciplined before I can successfully combine my sports with my studies. So you would have to wake up and know exactly what you want because in university, after that, it's your life. Your parents cannot live it for you. So you would have to make that decision for yourself. Thank you very much for that. And um, viewers and listeners out there, our young ones out there who are still in school, if you are interested in taking up any extracurricular activities, you should know that you should be disciplined and also stop procrastinating. <laughs> so <laughs> that is to all of us and those of us who are so even in the university, we have to stop that. Okay, so we'll move on to your profession. You are talking about GIS, 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 and someone will be out there, what is GIS? What is she talking about? What is this? What is it? So can you just briefly explain what that is for us? Okay. So GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems. That has to do more of um, the tech aspect of geography. I keep telling people that if you want to understand GIS, just look at geography in a technological sense. So it has to do with um, a software let me start with the software that you would use to create analysis. So instead of you manually making the analysis yourself, doing all the calculations and others, there's a software for you to help to help you make it easier. If you want to do some form of, let's say, flood analysis, there's a software to help you do that. So GIS is kind of, um, it encompasses data, it encompasses the software you use, it encompasses the people who work with the software, it encompasses the, the use of the internet. So we have web GIS, we have um, cloud computing in GIS. We have, um, basically GIS is like the tech involvement of geography. So once you understand it in that sense, it kind of helps you to understand that GIS easily puts you in the tech ecosystem as well because you would have to learn some form of programming, some aspects. It's only, there are some aspects of GIS that need programming. There are some that you don't really need programming, but you need to have a geographic thought, a way of thinking in a geographic sense and understanding data that's location-based data. So mostly we work with location-based data. So your longitude and latitude that you were learning in school, that's GIS. The maps you are having in your atlas, that is GIS. So basically, we make the maps that you see. And during the corona period, we know that um, there were these maps that came out. I know when there was uh, TV3 is giving news, they have this map that they show. That is actually GIS. So basically, it has to do with mapping. That's what we are known for, but that's not the only thing we do. We do more than mapping. So yeah, I'll, I'll start with this. As we are getting closer, then I'll explain further. Thank you for that. And uh, I've been hearing people that uh, work with uh, GIS, like always talking about geospatial industry. What is that one about? Okay, so the geospatial industry is basically the earth and space. So as I was explaining earlier with the course we did in school, we were looking at the earth, uh, looking at the earth surface, basically studying anything related to the earth and time. So geospatial has to do with any field that has to do with the earth. So we have those who are working in um, engineering, those who have to do the earth engineering. So like we have earth science, we have geomatic engineers, we have um, civil engineers, we have um, we have um, people who study the ocean. We have people who study even animals, the, bio, the biodiversity and all those things. 
people who study anything with the earth, they are involved in the geospatial industry. So the industry has to do with all those companies, fields of work, fields of study that have to do with the earth. So that encompasses a lot of fields, so many. So um, someone, do you call someone in, um, how do I say it? Do you call someone who works with a GIS, a GIS mapping specialist? Is that what it is? Yeah, that was my role at the company I was working at. Mm -hmm. So it depends on what you're doing. They are said there are actually core levels in GIS, but when you go to a specific company, depending on what you are supposed to do, they can kind of classify your role in a different way. So for me, the first company I worked for, I was actually um, a GIS data personnel. So what I did was basically to upload data, edit data, location data, or you can even see that as a GIS technician. So for a while, I actually had the profession GIS technician because of the level I was at. So with the GIS technician, there are certain things you can do. And we also have the GIS developer who can also code. So there's a, the person who codes a lot. So your, um, let me say your profession will depend on the kind of skills you have in relation to GIS work. Yeah. So um, why did you decide to take up your profession like in GIS and then what inspired it? What is the motivation behind that? Well, that's a very interesting question. Sometimes I wonder if I chose the field or <laughs> I ran into it. Because, <laughs> as I said earlier, I've always been interested in geography since GHS, in fact, before GHS. So I have constantly had it in my mind to do geography. But mind you, I never knew what I wanted to do with it. I was scared because I didn't know much about how I could make money with geography. I never thought about it. And the only field I knew at that time related to geography was a geography teacher. And I loved my geography teacher, in fact. He was one of the people who really inspired me to push forward. Even though the course was a bit difficult, I was able to push forward. So I was quite shy and I knew that I can't stand in front of people and talk. So I wanted to think of another role that I could take up and I wasn't getting any. But I still decided to continue it in university. And that was where I found GIS in my third year. So in my third year, as someone who likes geography and who also likes tech, when I saw that course and I did research on it and I realized what it was, that alone was enough to con convince me to take it up because I realized that it is actually, it's a tech, um, let me see, it's a tech system. Therefore, since the future is running in, into tech and we are applying a lot of tech systems, that means that this field will become very important one day. So in a way, I was thinking farther into the future and thinking of how I could possibly make it important. Because I realized that in Ghana, people didn't know about it. When I'm doing my analysis in my room and my friends come around and they see what I'm doing, they get so confused. And I, I keep telling them, it looks so beautiful. I do an analysis and I'm like, it looks so beautiful. And they're like, Sienna, what the heck are you talking about? I can't see what you're, what you're describing. So I knew that people didn't know much about the field. They didn't know what they could use it for. But I had faith and I decided to push through it and then continue that field. Um, thank you for that. So we have a question here. Um, it says, is there any application of GIS in the field of medicine? Yes, there are lots. So the, as I mentioned earlier, the corona map you keep seeing, that can be applied in any health issue you have. We have maps for malaria, we have maps that is looking at polio, we have maps that is looking at any health-related issue. Um, I'm not too sure whether hospitals are applying GIS now, but I know pharmaceutical companies are, especially the international ones. They apply from, um, sorry, geospatial analysis because you would have to keep track of the areas that are having 
health issues and why those areas are having those health issues and know when to get your, let's say your pharmaceutical products there to cater for that issue. So I actually had a video to show, but I'm not sure that I have time. This is for, can I show the video? Yes, definitely. Okay. Let me show the video and I'm happy that this question came up. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, I'm not allowed to show. Um, I'm giving you the opportunity to show so you can show it now. Thank you for that. Okay. Okay. So now I am sharing my screen. Yes. Can you hear the video? My name is Jillian Elder. I'm the director of our enterprise location intelligence team at Walgreens. Our enterprise location intelligence group is well placed right in our corporate strategy organization. What this means is that we're well positioned in order hear to the audio? a bunch of the divisions yes. of the company. Okay. So we end up partnering with divisions. So this is a video I pulled from Esri. Esri is one is like the biggest GIS company in the world. Understanding our customers, and this is a company live, that is a pharmaceutical company us is that uses do, location that's intelligence. In ways, a spatial that's question. Location, work and artificial our, intelligence, our analysis and our mapping to help them make decisions is, is centered around serving customers. Walgreens has started an initiative to offer flu shots at nearly every location. With a, a network of 8,000 stores, we really have the ability to identify sales trends of products that are relating to flu. And with that, a flu index was created. Now, the way we get this data is we use our prescriptions for antiviral medications. And that, for us, is our best indicator of flu activity because, generally speaking, when someone has a positive flu test, uh, they are getting prescribed an antiviral to help treat it. When we combine that in with our mapping applications, we were able to, before the CDC could report on it, understand where flu was happening throughout the country. It was very important for us to have a simple mapping platform that would illustrate what we were showing in the flu index each week. What the CDC does is their data is reported on a two week lag, whereas inside of a week we're able to turn around data. So I think that, you know, that really helped us in terms of the credibility of the flu index because ours was, was close. Okay. So I think that was a shot. I didn't show the full thing because it's quite long. But as you saw, um, this is a pharmaceutical company and based on where their branches are located, they were able to track based on the purchases of their customers, the parts of the country that had maybe high levels of flu because of the kind of prescriptions people were coming in for. So based on keeping track of the location activity of your customers, of the people who are sick. So if you see something like, my general hospital if more people with a specific illness come there that means that there's a red flag in that area especially when the people are from tema so that's when you can now bring in resources to come and find out why that area is recording that number or that high number of that specific illness so gis can really be applied in health it's actually a course under geography and resource development in school and if you read more on it especially location intelligence. You can see that it's like one of the best tools people would need, um, especially governments would need for their health um, sector. Thank you very much. That was really informative. And um, viewers out there, if you just joined us um, today, we have a, a wonderful host, yes, Fiana. And please keep your questions coming. If you have any question, just type it uh, in our chat box here on Zoom and on Facebook in our comments box. And um, this great woman will answer your questions for you. <laughs> now let us continue. So um, how has your career journey been so far uh, combined with being an advocate in STEM and a GIS um advocate and then also teaching linkedin personal branding yeah you do a lot of things <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> Someone has actually mentioned that. In fact, quite a number of people have mentioned that that um, at my age I'm doing quite a lot. And uh to be honest, other people are also doing quite a lot too. So but um the journey has been, let me see, very unexpected. Um I just started talking about uh let me see i actually entered into the tech field when i had a boot camp i attended a boot camp to learn coding with developers in book and it was through that organization that i was introduced into the tech ecosystem and i started seeing the vast opportunities i started thinking about why gis is not so well known like tech and that kind of pushed me to start looking for ladies who were in the GIS industry in Africa, but I wasn't finding them. So after connecting with my co-founder of African Women in GIS, that's when we, after a while, we combined uh, minor, minor communities to form African Women in GIS. And um, I continuously spoke about STEM because I realized that it's a field that you can combine with any other thing you're doing. I always keep telling people that don't focus on only one field if you can, if you want to find, but if you are interested in other fields, it doesn't matter. Just look for that other field that you know you can add to what you already know as a complementary skill and then work with it. Because as the world is going, you need more than one skill. So as a STEM advocate, I kept talking to people who were in the science fields. Funny enough, I didn't do science, I did arts, but I found myself in the science um, labeled industry. So I keep telling people, especially those who didn't even do science, that you can switch anytime. So those who have the issue of doing courses in school that they feel they cannot really use when they come out, you can still learn something. We have online lessons, we have boot camps, you have schools that have come out that are teaching certain courses. You can just do that and then go into the field you want to do. So, it's, um, yeah, it's it's been quite a journey. We are still, I'm still learning. I'm always still learning, and I'm always willing to just give the little advice I have learned from experiences, from work, from friends to fellow people to just help you shorten that learning. Um, time. So the fact that it took a longer time for me to learn a certain um, lesson it will take you shorter and that will help us move forward faster. Thank you for that. So um, to me, the LinkedIn personal branding teaching sounds interesting. And I think it sounds interesting to people or the viewers uh, out there who are with us today. But I was like, wow, LinkedIn is a big platform and you teach LinkedIn personal branding? Wow, I want to know more about that. So um, could you please tell us what LinkedIn is? Because I know most of our young ones out there and even those who have graduated from the university do not know what LinkedIn is. So um, could you please tell us a little bit about that and why is it important? Why is LinkedIn personal branding important? Okay. So this is a very um, involving question. Um, the reason why I took LinkedIn quite seriously is because I actually wasn't taking it seriously for a while. I was introduced to it when I was in school, university, but I didn't see its importance. I mean, I can go to IG and enjoy pictures. I can go to Twitter and laugh. And I didn't know what I could use LinkedIn for when I was a student. But then when I, what I realized when I came out and I started working and I started paying more attention to LinkedIn, I realized that it was a platform that people thought was for jobs, which it actually is. That was the primary um, reason that they created it. But it's actually more than that. It has become a platform that you can share your ideas, you can share your advocacies, you can share your side work, your passion, 
especially that is professional. So your professional passion, your professional advocacies, and actually get kind of like a community of people that will see what you are doing. So it's the best platform to reach the people you want to reach directly, especially when you have a business or especially when you are trying to catch the attention of a specific maybe company or group. So one thing I realized with LinkedIn, as I kept posting, as I kept sharing my journey, as I kept showing the programs I was attending, the things I was doing, I realized that not only was I creating some form of digital reputation, but I was also motivating people. So that was kind of like what motivated me to actually come out and help those who also want to do the same. So I started teaching, um, having very short lessons with the coding group I had and also with other organizations that reached out to me to have a little webinar to talk about the platform and how they could improve themselves with it. So I keep telling people that make sure that your profile is on point. You have to have a professional picture. You have to be smiling to make you feel a little welcoming. And also to with your headline, that's the words that you have at the bottom of your picture. It should describe you. I keep telling people that um, as much as possible, um, even though you have you have to give loyalty to the company you are working with, you should also try as much as possible to bring, build a brand for yourself. So that God forbid, if the company is no longer there, your brand will stay and it will be easier for you to move on. Because if you make your life your company or well, it's for the CEOs in a way it is for them, but if you kind of use the company to brand yourself, when the company is no longer there, who are you? So you have to bring out who exactly you are and let people see you for who you really are. So that it's very easy for you to even switch industries without anybody really worrying because they know you for a specific skill that you have. They know you for a specific advocacy. So that branding that you have forced them to see is what they'll carry wherever they go. Because to mind you, people can give you a brand. In school, nicknames were actually a brand for us. But right now you have the, free, the freedom to create your own brand and be known by it. So LinkedIn is actually a platform that helped me see that you can actually do that with that platform. And it goes a long way in helping you accomplish so much because most people get opportunities from LinkedIn. And it's really, it's really nice to see how people benefit a lot from LinkedIn. Yeah, um, I can, I agree to that about people benefiting from LinkedIn because I reach out to most of the professionals in my area on LinkedIn. And sometimes I even get emails or like emails from people or connections from people asking me if I'm interested in this job. So yeah, LinkedIn is a very important um, social media platform for uh, professionals and like branding yourself is very important. So thank so you for that. Easier. Yes. So that makes it easier for, for jobs to come to you rather yeah. than you going out to search for jobs. Mm -hmm. so I keep telling people that right now, the way the place, I mean, like the world is moving, um, it's very important for you to build a brand for yourself, especially on a social media platform that has over 30 million companies. I mean, once you make yourself well-known, when you're posting things you're interested in, and you know a specific company is interested in it, you can tag the company in your post. You can tag certain key people in your post. And then with that, people can actually reach out to you with job opportunities, program opportunities that when you attend, you actually start building a trend for you to accomplish more. So there are some people who are shy. They don't like to show themselves. That is okay. But I would say try and find how you can show who you really are and how you can show what you can do because that's the best way to get the right, let me say, jobs that you'll be really happy doing. Yeah, thank you very much. We really have to invite you for the um, LinkedIn branding teaching. That is very important for um, the youth and then uh, the teenagers coming up. It's yeah. really important. Even people think that uh, once you are, you've completed SHS, 
you, you don't have to get a LinkedIn uh, profile or something. But I keep on telling people, no. Yeah. Professors out there, if you want to apply for universities like graduate school or even uh, just a bachelor's degree, professors come to look at your profile on LinkedIn. So you have to make sure you have a LinkedIn profile. But yeah, thank you. We have to invite you for that one, <laughs> a special one for that. Um, so um, let's get back to GIS. <laughs> How do you see the importance of GIS for Ghana as a country? You've said a lot, obviously, and the world as a whole um, in the next five to 10 years. like. Yeah, you've said a lot, but I just want you to um, say it again. Yeah. <laughs> want me to hammer on it? Okay. Yeah. Um, I would say my message is they shouldn't underestimate the importance of location data. If you add location thoughts, in fact, location thinking to managing your country, to some extent, it makes it easier for you to allocate resources, to make it easier for you to think into the future. So project um, projections, to make projections for the future. And it makes it easier for you to make very location accurate decisions. So I would say in the next five to 10 years, if God willing, the government is able to implement a lot of their technological innovations and add location data to it, it will make it very easy to know exactly how the world or how the country is growing, especially in terms of settlement, settlements planning. We have people who do GIS that are town planners, who are urban planners and all that. So people like that, when they come together, they form a team with the government um, teams that have to do with planning and development. I have I, I know quite a number of my lecturers. They were part of government um, commission committees and others that used to make certain decisions like that. So if you have people like that as part of your teams in making certain um, accurate decisions, it makes it easier to plan for the future faster and more smart. Because um, there's even a concept called smart cities that has to do with IoT your spatial location intelligence and where well, again, basically IoT and um, location intelligence. So those kind of concepts, if you have someone who thinks in that way, I wouldn't say you should push or force people to accept the technology, but you can, uh, you can actually embed very simple technologies to making our lives easier and using location as part of it. I keep one example I gave one time was um, with the traffic. I mean, where where I work and where I stay is so far apart that's moving. When I was moving from one end to another, I always used to get like about three traffic congestion spots. So if you are able to map out those spots, figure out what exactly or how we could make the maybe traffic lights smarter, to see that, okay, this area gets jammed at this time. So maybe it will be green till maybe the next two traffic lights. It actually takes real time um, location data and uses that to make real time decisions. So making smart systems like that could actually help. Someone will say, when can we get there and all that? But to be honest, we, the technology already exists. It's just up to us to apply it and up to us to be disciplined enough to manage it and keep it working constantly. Thank you very much. Uh, so you mentioned IoT, if I'm correct, is Internet of Things, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Could you please just briefly explain that? Because I want the young ones out there to get everything, every technical word you use here. Yeah. So with the IoT, it has to do with um, basically how the internet can control uh, appliances around you. So if you watch movies, you realize that there's this person who can control the light in his house with his iPad or his tablet. There's someone who can control the stove. There's someone who can control even the fireplace. 
where they sit down by the chimney and all that. So all that is IoT, that's Internet of Things. How the appliances or the things around you are connected in a system that uses the Internet to operate. So that's the basic way I can explain it. And I hope it helps. Yeah. <laughs> so you, re- you realize that there was this system that came out during Corona where people were using the sensor wash basin where it, it, once it senses your hands, then the water will flow. Once it senses your hands, you can get soap. So that's basically an example of IoT. Thank you very much for that. So um, let's move into STEM. Obviously, as you said, you are a STEM advocate. So yeah. can you tell us more about being an advocate for STEM and GIS and your thoughts on stimulating the interest of teenagers or young adults in STEM, especially in Ghana? Hmm. Yes. So with this issue, um, I like to encourage organizations that are running STEM programs and GIS programs to start from the very beginning. Start from primary school, expand their horizons. Because me, when I was in primary, I didn't know a field like geography. All I knew was there was a channel called Geographic, National Geographic Channel, and I loved it. That was all. I didn't know that there was a field like um, the study of oceans, the study of uh, business, GIS and business. No, I had no idea. But then I realized that I was quite narrow-minded in the kind of fields that were available. So whenever someone comes to ask in the class, who do you want to become in the future when you grow? We hear the normal ones, doctor, nurse, teacher, very normal. But as you grow and as I finished school, that was university, I started seeing more fields, more occupations, more professions that I had never heard about. So especially with the STEM courses, People think that with a STEM, you just think of medicine, engineer, this, that. They are very, very uh, core STEM fields, but there are also other fields that are like the combination of some of them. So as I was saying, I did geography. So GIS, uh, location intelligence, is actually the combination of tech and uh, geography with artificial intelligence under tech. So with the evolution of the fields in tech and the other STEM fields, we have to start from the very beginning, the children, and let them see and let them understand that there are other occupations available so that when they are growing and they are picking their courses, especially in uni, in GHS, they know what to pick because they know that it will influence their future. But another thing I keep saying is that don't only start with the children, but starts with the parents as well. So as you teach the children, because the children will always go home and go and mention what they've learned to the parents. And if the parents don't see any need for it, they can disapprove of their child, even joining a club that will actually enable the child to learn that skill. So you also have to educate the parents to see why their children should be allowed to expand their horizons, to explain to them how the world is going. Because some of them are so caught up in their little world that they don't know what is going on out there. They watch news and stuff, yes. But with the tech aspect, they wouldn't pay attention to it. If it wasn't for the field I did, my parents would never pay attention to web maps. That's the corona map that was being shown on TV. So now when they see, they call me, nah, your, your field is being shown. When they see drones, so Zipline and the others, they call me, nah, you went to learn drones. They are showing drones. So it's like, if the parents are also exposed to those fields and they see the importance of it, then it kind of makes them happy to support their children to also do it. So as a STEM advocate, I also want to encourage um, organizations that are running those programs to start to also have programs for the children and for the parents and also to continue with the youth because it's actually growing. And I'm happy with the fact that a lot of programs are existing to help the youth to embrace tech skills, to embrace basically 
the tech, yeah, the tech skills. So it's very important. Thank you very much. I really appreciate this input. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Viewers and listeners out there, um, I really wish we would not complete this discussion today <laughs> because I'm learning a lot and I hope you are also doing. Um, so please, if you just joined us, this is Teen Leadership and Entrepreneur Development Foundation. My name is Augustina Osabute. I am your host for today's program and I have Sienna Williams here as our resource person. She's an expert in um, GIS and yeah, I really don't want to end this program today, but unfortunately uh, we have to continue and then end it. So um, I have a question here. Um, someone is asking if you have any class uh, in SHS, um, being a STEM advocate and then a GIS advocate. Um, unfortunately, we don't have. Um, one of the missions that my community had was to actually take, encourage our members in the various countries, African countries or African neighborhoods, to go out to schools and talk about GIS. That's to create like some form of GIS awareness program. But to have a club, no, I don't know of any, sorry, I don't know of any GIS related clubs. But when I was in school, I knew that there was a club for tourism. There was a club for like these earth related clubs. We had clubs like that, but not uh, solely for GIS. No, I don't know of any clubs like that. But I encourage anyone who is interested in creating one to go ahead and create it. Post about it on LinkedIn. You will definitely get organizations in the GIS industry to reach out to you and help you with programs. So, yeah. That, that's really great. So um, what do you do outside work? I sound like I do only work. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Hello. <laughs> yeah, funny enough, someone has asked me that question before too. And to be honest, I don't know what answer to give the person because I'm the kind of person who I don't like to be idle. I like to constantly be doing things. But one thing I've realized I really enjoy doing is, well, watching movies <laughs> and going out. If I get a chance to go out and I am okay with where we are going and I'm feeling adventurous, I will follow you. So, yeah. That's great. I think you are my partner. <laughs> That's what I do too. I only watch movies. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so um, you've given us a lot of information today. And, um, I'm really interested to know about um, what has been your greatest achievement in your career. This is a little difficult to answer. Because a lot of things have made me very proud. The fact that I was able to build a profession out of a field that most people didn't know about and most people didn't really believe in. Um, the fact that I'm always able to impact the youth like this. The fact that um, I've been able to create a community for African women around the world to come together and share the ideas on GIS and teach others and learn. And also the fact that I was featured in the Esri Women in Geospatial, sorry, Women in GIS book. That was a really big event for me because as I said, I'm quite young. When people hear my age, they go like, I'm so young and I've done so much, but I think that's that's about it, yeah. These, these few things have actually made me sit down and actually appreciate the fact that I have achieved quite a number of things and I'm happy about it and I'm, I hope to do more. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so how I spotted you on LinkedIn was from the Esri book <laughs> when you oh, were okay. featured in the book. I was like, great, I have to bring, him on, bring her on board. And yeah, and I'm really happy you accepted to be on uh, our platform today. And um, so what study techniques would you uh, recommend for students out there and young ones out there 
who want to um, pursue your profession or get into uh, your career? Okay, for well, study techniques, um, it's 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 personal. Everybody has how they study. I mean, you just have to know what's how you how your study pattern is. Some people are early risers. Some are nocturnal. I was a nocturnal learner, and um, I like group discussions a lot and uh, thinking out loud, watching videos reading the internet i like videos a lot in fact that was the fastest way i could learn and yeah and also for the university people i'd like to tell you that please with your level 100 and 200 time make sure you make all your grades because when you get to 300 and 400 raising that gpa is going to be so difficult if you are failing so please Concentrate a lot in your first and second years. I know you have to have fun. Have fun, but try as much as possible to make sure that you make the grades in level 100 and 200. I'm not saying don't make the grades in 300 and 400, please. If you can continue it, continue it, but force yourself to make the grades in level 100 and 200. And if you are a major student and you are doing your long essay, that's your thesis, make sure that you force to make a good grade in it. Because that alone can push your GPA at the last minute. So make sure you focus a lot on your longest. Do not slack on it at all. And uh, yeah, group discussions are very important. Make sure you surround yourself with very hardworking people and very intelligent people. There's a saying that goes around that if you're the most intelligent person in the room, leave the room and look for another room. Because you need to be around people who challenge you to learn who challenge you to do things beyond your comfort so that you can be better. So um, for steady techniques, look for your own. You can definitely find it. Just try different techniques and see which one works best for you. But make sure that you also get enough rest because your mind cannot um, work well without rest. So please find some time to relax and chill. Okay, yeah. but thank you very much. Learn time management is very important. Thank you very much. I'm not. I guess I'm not the only one who has been stressing on this. Like my younger siblings can testify to that. I'm always on them. Hey, you are in level 100 and level 200. This is why you have to make the grace. Make sure yeah. you bring the grace home. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess I'm correct. Thank you very much. So um, what is your take on uh, one having a mentor or a role model in life, be it in education or career? Okay, so this one as well is also personal. There are some people who don't really have mentors, but they have people who are like advisors. So someone like me, people didn't really know my field. I didn't know anybody who really understood my field. So it was just the minor advices I was hearing from my friends and family that, Sienna, this field looks like it's really good. If you really feel that passionate about it, go ahead and do it. Try and look for ways to expand your knowledge on it and expand the area of study and impact. And if you are someone to, who is, it's, um, you just see someone's life story, and you get motivated to do something for yourself. Like you can motivate yourself easily. That's okay. You can also get a mentor who will keep you on your toes. But I wouldn't say it's it's by force or it's not necessary or what. But you as a person should know what you want. As I keep saying earlier, one thing I keep telling people that I'm trying to teach them about self-development is know yourself. That's the first thing. And it's a, little, it's a little difficult. Some people don't know themselves. Some people don't know what they want. Some people don't know what they want to do and all that. So sometimes it helps to talk to the people who know you really well. Talk to them. Let them tell you what exactly they see you doing best or the areas they see are your strengths. Then try and think about the things that are of interest to you and then try and expand on that. So I'll say know yourself first before you can make the decision whether you want a mentor or not. Or for role models, they are all around. 
anybody can be a role model to you as long as a person does something that encourages you to do more with your life and with what you want to do. So that decision lies with you. I, I cannot give you that answer. Thank you very much. So um, what advice do you have for the young ones to help them make um, their dreams a reality, especially ladies taking up STEM careers? Huh, okay. The advice, I think I mentioned quite a number of us I was talking. Yeah, you did. Um, yeah. So as I said earlier, just know yourself very well. Try as much as possible to learn complementary skills, skills that are a little out of your usual field, but can help you in life. And please learn personal finances, no matter how young you are. Learn how to manage your personal finances. It's very important. People don't really mention it, but it's very, very important. Learn um, tech skills. As the world is moving, no matter which field you are in, learn tech skills. Even if you're a medicine student, learn something around tech in medicine. It can help you. It can help you to stand out. Brand yourself, personal branding. You don't need, you, do, you, can, you can use LinkedIn, but you can also brand yourself even on Twitter, on IG. Just pick that one thing that you want people to know you by and use that to brand yourself. And what well, again? <laughs> Keep track of your plans that you are making and the plans you make, make sure you make achievable ones. Don't write really vague and over the top plans. Start small, achieve them. When you achieve them, um, make sure that you, are, you reward yourself and also make sure that um, basically you, you pray a lot. That's, that's the basic one. <laughs> pray in any plan you are making, in any decision you want to make and go for it. I mean, you can do it. Don't worry. It doesn't matter your situation. You can do it. Thank you very much, um, Sienna. I really appreciate um, you being available for us today. And um, to our listeners out there, um, to our viewers out there, you can do it no matter your situation. So let us all try our best to get whatever plans we have done. So um, if you just join us, um, this is still Leadership and Entrepreneur Development Foundation. And um, we have Sienna here today on our Talk on STEM Careers program. We have our social media handles. Um, the main objective is to get the message out there to the young ones. So if you are a teacher, if you're a parent and you get access to any of our videos, please share it to the young ones out there. Let them watch it on your phone. Also, um, on YouTube, uh, social media platform name is Teen Lead Foundation on YouTube. Please share and then subscribe to our channel so that you get access to any um, videos that we put up there. We also have here on Facebook, Teen Leadership and Entrepreneur Development Foundation. We also have our website, www.teenlead.com, teenleadfoundation.com. And um, we have on LinkedIn, Teen Lead Foundation. So please follow us on all our social media handles, like our pages and share the videos. Let the videos get to the young ones out there. I'm really passionate about this one. So <laughs> I talk about it with much passion, but please, we really want this information to get out there. So um, Sienna, wonderful Sienna, <laughs> uh, how can one reach you um, if they want to get in contact with you, like where? It's a LinkedIn. Okay. This is yeah. also a strategy to make people to join LinkedIn. So if yeah. you want to get to me, join LinkedIn. So what is your full name on LinkedIn? So that um, can... it's Sihana C Y H A N A. So you can think about it on like Cynthia and Hannah. Sihana Lena. That's L E N A, and then Williams. Thank you very much for that. So yeah, really, if you want to get hold of her, you have to get a LinkedIn profile. And I bet you that is really important. You never regret it when you join LinkedIn. You learn a lot from there. 
Um, personally, I'm learning a lot from LinkedIn, so please do join. And so what is your last remarks as we end our session today? Well, my last remark is whatever you want to start, start it now. Don't procrastinate. Whatever you want to build, whatever business you want to do, don't procrastinate. Start it now. And nine to five workers, please get a side hustle. Do not rely on only your salary. Okay, that's all I have. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, you don't know how happy I am that you have built yourself today uh, for us on this platform. And um, I wish we can continue with this program, but we all have to go out there and continue with our normal duties. So um, thank you very much once again for joining us. And um, as usual, those on Zoom, um, definitely you have to wait and then continue the session with this great woman. You don't want her to leave and learn and so that all your questions. You, you are not able to ask all your questions. Yeah, so those who are watching us from Facebook, this is what we do. We try and then have some time with our resource persons on Zoom after uh, streaming on Facebook. So if you want to have that fun with us, join us on Zoom next time. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. This is Teen Leadership and Entrepreneur Development Foundation. Our main objective is to help the young ones out there reach their career goals. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. See you next week.